Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Been a while since I've done a, a show on sort of current events. Been a week or two. In any event, I'm back after some professional obligations. And uh, so it, it looks like it's potential. I'm not putting my view one way or the other. It seems like there may be uh, some stormy waters for the fraternity of St. Peter because, and here's why I'm going to show you something from Edward Penton, and I'm going to show you something else to show you what I'm talking about. So here is Edward Penton. He said, Pope Francis this morning received in private audience Father Andres Komorowski, Superior General of the Traditional Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter, the FSSP. Okay. Now, does that mean anything on its own? No, of course not. Just because he had a meeting, it doesn't mean anything at all. Unless we look at this in the context of what we have recently from the Fraternity of St. Peter on social media. I'm just going to pull this up here. And let me just share my screen here. This is a tweet. I guess it was on Facebook. I don't know. I don't have Facebook. I just see screenshots of these things. So here is from the fraternity. This was a, a month ago now. Happy leap year, by the way. In the midst of the uncertainty in the church and the world, the fraternity of St. Peter will be renewing its consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary on February 11th. Hey, there's no problem with that. If that was all it was, there'd be nothing to think about here. Our future remains uncertain after the motu proprio traditionis custodis of July 21st, of July, sorry, 2021, and there was no better place for us to go than to our mother. Please join the fraternity members, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, pray for the fraternity, et cetera. Important part here is, in the midst of the uncertainty in the church, because of traditionis custodis, we are worried about things. That is the context of this. I'm actually surprised they posted this. Uh, usually the fraternity, I, I find, keeps things under the hat. Nonetheless, that combined with the fact that there was a meeting with Pope Francis, which was probably scheduled sometime in advance. He's a very busy man, Pope Francis. Now we have this situation where the fraternity of St. Peter is asking for prayers because of traditionis custodis. We're going to talk about why that's important. Uh, and does this mean the fraternity of St. Peter is going to be on the chopping block? We're going to talk about the tightrope that the fraternity of St. Peter has had to walk and why there, there is reason for concern. I mean, I'm not here to be the doomsday person. I'm not saying I have any insider information, but there is reason to be concerned based on the history and based on the recent events. And we should all be informed about that. There are many traditional Catholics that uh, attend the fraternity, and this will be good to know. Um, and I imagine there are certain priests that are in the fraternity that are worried as well, and this might help them make sense of it because it's a complicated issue. And uh, we're going to get into the meat of it, but first I just wanted to mention that I'm going to Italy this fall with Father Albert Calio, traditional Dominican. It is a once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage opportunity, and here is some information on it. All the trouble in Rome, it is easy to forget about one unshakable fact. Our church is the Roman Catholic Church, and Rome is the Eternal City. What a perfect time to go on a pilgrimage to the Eternal City and the other monumental sites of Catholic heritage in beautiful Italy. Join Father Albert Calio and me this November as we tour through the shrines of Italy and the Amalfi Coast as we attend daily Mass in the Old Rite in the footsteps of St. Peter and St. Francis. Click the link in the description to register for this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to discover the heart of the Catholic faith in the heart of the old Roman Empire. Check the link in the description or you can visit kennedyhall.ca slash Italy. Lastly, please check out, or two things. You can sign up for my Substack. I've got a bunch of interviews that have been going up there that are for paid subscribers. They're there first for a few days before the general public gets them. It's also the same as if you join as a YouTube member. You can join as a YouTube member for as little as, I think, $3 a month. I call that buy me a coffee because it's literally the price of like a grande coffee at Starbucks now. Not that you should go to Starbucks because you're going to get your coffee from some weirdo with 17 piercings and blue hair who you don't know if is a Johnny or a Jenny, and that's kind of the point. Uh, but nonetheless, it's called Buy Me a Coffee. You can also go for more if you want. And I think Substack is about 8 bucks a month, 80 bucks for the year, but you get more goodies on Substack. There's more long-form writing, which is why it's it's more of an investment. But anyway, thanks to everybody who's signed up. Um, check out those links in the description. And if you'd like to support the only traditional Catholic boarding school in Canada, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Academy, there is a link to donate to them in the description box for this podcast, whether you're watching or listening. All right. Before I continue, we are going to bring up some information that has to do with the foundation of the Fraternity of St. Peter and some of the statements of the various superiors, either national superiors or 
the or the superior general or combinations thereof and what that has to do with what's going on right now with the uncertainty about the fraternity of saint peter a caveat the fraternity of saint peter is a uh, there's hundreds of priests many of them have different opinions about very important issues i know this because i've talked to them personally within the history of the fraternity there have been moments where one faction is getting super SSPX sounding. One faction wants more of the hermeneutic continuity. At times, the leadership has had to step in. Rome has had to sort of try to help them sort it out. This is nothing new. This is not scandalous information. This is not an attack on the fraternity. This has nothing to do with individual priests or persons. But if we care about traditional Catholicism, we care primarily about the faith. And Dr. K even though I've already, uh, there's actually an interview with Dr. Kwasniewski. If you want to watch that, it'll be available for the public in a couple days, but it's for YouTube members and Substack members. You can check out the first one in our series of two interviews. In his book, Bound by Truth, amazing book. And But he talks about the issues traditionalists are facing in there. And one of the things that he talks about in spades is that it's the faith, the faith, the faith, the faith. We don't compromise on the faith. So if an organization of priests finds itself in a position where there is something that might seem like a compromise with the spirit of Vatican II, the Novus Ordo paradigm, and so forth, then we have to ask ourselves if that has anything to do with the potential of the fraternity getting squashed. Again, this doesn't have to do with individual priests. I want to harp on this because I don't want people to be saying, Kennedy, this is just sour grapes. You're an SSPX guy. I have no ill will towards any individual fraternity priest I have no ill will between towards any individual who attends the fraternity. Some of my best friends attend the fraternity, and I would be heartbroken if their parishes were closed because I know that those are wonderful, beautiful places where they raise their families, and nobody wants that to happen. Okay? Let's just all be clear on that. But we're just going to look at some information, and um, and that's what we're going to do. Okay. So I'm going to bring up my documents here because I want to make sure I don't get any of this wrong. So give me half a second. All right. Let's go to sort of the root of the problem where we're facing right now. So... In 2019, Pope Francis closed or suppressed what was called the Pontifical, Ecle Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Day. And this was the organization within the church. It was a commission, uh, an organization, committee, whatever you want to call it, which was tasked with handling the traditionalists within the church. What's fascinating about this is that the Ecclesia Day also dealt with the SSPX as well as the fraternity and so forth. So, I don't know how people would say the SSPX was in schism when there was a commission that was tasked with dealing with them. But anyway, that's another argument. Point being, the Ecclesia Day Commission was closed in 2019. And it was the responsibilities thereof were absorbed by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. At the time, most people didn't think this was a big deal. They actually thought it was probably a good thing. But I think it was Chris Ferrara I think, I might be wrong, I think he was the only one, the well-known scholar, I think he was the only well-known scholar who was sounding the alarm bell saying, this actually looks bad for tradition. And then when Traditionis Custodis came out in 2021, trying to crush a Latin mass, I think Ferrar was, I think there was some information about him being vindicated on that. I might be wrong on that. Okay. So Pope Francis suppressed this in 2019. At the time, it was unclear what the significance of the suppression would be long-term. Now, interestingly, you always want to look to these liberal theologians because they tell you exactly what the modernists are thinking. And uh, Massimo Fagioli, he's a super liberal theologian. He's really annoying. Um, but he said the message was clear. And he said you can. Uh, what the commission was saying is you can have your preconciliar liturgy, but you cannot have pre-Vatican II doctrine. Very interesting statement. Okay, so what is Ecclesia Day based on? Ecclesia Day is based on a letter written by John Paul II wherein he alleged that Archbishop Lefebvre had excommunicated himself, and this document was called Ecclesia Day Ad Flicta. I talk about that at length in my book, SSPX The Defense. And John Paul explained what he believed to be the fundamental reason for the Vatican's conflict with the SSPX. I'm just going to read that in full here for you so you can understand it. Okay, so here's what's from the document. This was John Paul II wrote this. He said, The root of this schismatic act can be discerned in an incomplete and contradictory notion of tradition. So interesting. John Paul II is alleging that 
Archbishop Lefebvre had an incomplete understanding of tradition. I don't believe that, but he said incomplete because it does not take sufficiently into account the living character of tradition. So living tradition. This is a Trojan horse. We'll get to that in a minute. Which, as the Second Vatican Council clearly taught, comes from the apostles and progresses in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit. There is growth in insight into the realities and words that are being passed on. This comes about in various ways. It comes through the contemplation and study of believers who ponder these things in their hearts. It comes from the intimate sense of spiritual realities, which they experience. And it comes from the preaching of those who have received, along with their right of succession in the episcopate, the sure charism of truth. This is a mouthful. This is Vatican II. Everything in Vatican II is a mouthful. Now, this is from Vatican II's document, De Verbum Number 8. Now, this statement has been considered by the who's who of traditional Catholicism as a very modernist-sounding statement. And why? Why? Well, let's look at it. So the idea is the SSPX is schismatic because of the fundamental error in the SSPX's thinking where they don't recognize the living experience-based nature of tradition. This is, go read the document by Pius X, Pashendi. I'm writing about this now in my book. This is a very problematic understanding of tradition. We're going to go over the, in a little while, we're going to go over um, something that I wrote on my substack comparing the pre and post conciliar understanding of tradition and how they're radically different, radically different. So the idea is that the SSPX isn't with the program when it comes to understanding of tradition. But here's the thing. This document by John Paul II squashes the SSPX and sets up the Ecclesia Day. So what ends up happening is the fraternity, and this is a quote from their website, which I'll bring up to you in just a minute. They say they're founded in the spirit of the apostolic letter Ecclesia Dei Ad Flicta. So presumably, at least from the text that we're going to look at, the fraternity and congregations like it, the other Ecclesia Dei commissions, uh, communities, they do recognize this very novel concept of tradition as being fundamental. Now, again, there's a difference between the brass officialdom and the priests. I'm not denying that. This isn't a criticism of particular priests, as I said, just something to keep in mind as we enter into this uncertainty about the fraternity. And I'm going to pull that up, up for you here so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So here is from the Fraternity of St. Peter website. So this is, this is their stuff. Here's what it says. This is the aim of the fraternity. This is part of the constitutions of the FSSP. It says, the, and this right here, I got the orange there. I was keyword searching origin. The particular aim of the Fraternity of St. Peter is to achieve the objective truth, the faithful observance of, through the object, sorry, achieve this objective through the faithful observance of the liturgical and disciplinary traditions according to the dispositions of the motu proprio Ecclesia Dei of John Paul II, 1988, which is at the origin of its foundation. So let me just do this again. The particular aim of the fraternity of St. Peter is to achieve this objective, and I guess this should be the objective here, the objective of the fraternity is the sanctification of priests through the exercise of the priesthood, and in particular, the turn to turn the life of the priest toward that which is essentially his raison d'etre, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, with all that it signifies, all that flows from it, all that goes with it. That's great. That sounds perfect. That sounds just like the SSPX in many ways. But then here's the difference. The particular aim of the fraternity is to achieve this objective, so achieve the holiness of the priests through the Mass, through the faithful observance of the liturgical and disciplinary traditions according to the dispositions of the motu proprio Ecclesia Dei. So the understanding of what traditions are, both liturgical and disciplinary, is through the lens of what tradition is in Ecclesia Dei ad flicta, which we just went over. So this means that at least in some way, that document, which is very problematic, I think all traditionalists, like, Folks who attend the FSSP, folks who are Institute of Christ the King, independent chapel guys, Sede Vacant, everyone who would call themselves a committed traditionalist would say that there are problems with that document. And in fact, that document no longer has juridical, actually, that's not true. Well, it's complicated. 
the excommunications were lifted in 2009, and I think that referred to uh, the document uh, written by Cardinal Gantin a day before. But nonetheless, that commission, the Ecclesia Day, was suppressed, and that document. So the document itself doesn't even really have any effect anymore because it's kind of a moot point. Uh, so that that the foundations of the fraternity are at the at the start of it, or or, or are found in that document. The fact that that commission was suppressed or ab absorbed in, in 2019, we start to see here where there might be some shaky ground if people are worried about the fraternity getting closed down. And, and, and that's just what we're looking at here. That's just what we're looking at here. All right. There's more information I want to bring up to you here. So we've looked at the website. Um, now, I should, I should comment more on this idea of living tradition. So this comes from De Verbum. So according to this understanding of living tradition, the role of the magisterium is not necessarily seen as a safeguard for the deposit of revelation, the deposit of faith, but to ensure what we would consider ecclesial communion in space and time. So visibly, so-and-so has allegiance to his bishop and so forth, and there's this fraternity, this, this fraternal charity, this uh, social charity, let's call it. So fidelity to tradition in this new concept does not mean, first of all, fidelity to a deposit handed down from the apostles, but rather docility to what the Pope, guarantor of unity, says today. So the Pope says it, we must find a way to understand it. And this, this mentality is, is, in a sense, very Catholic, but it's become very disordered in our day. This is ultimately a very novel understanding of tradition. Um which assures, we might say, continuity with the past, not by the sameness of dogma necessarily, but more by the sameness of experiences. And again, you got to go read Pashendi by Pius X because he goes over this idea of tradition being a lived thing and these religious experiences are what we express to each other and this is real religious tradition. This is a modernist idea. Now, there's a way to talk about it that's not modernist, but no matter how you talk about it, it does get in modernist waters. And I think every traditionalist of goodwill would admit that. So essentially, we have the same religious experiences as the apostles, but not necessarily through our beliefs. Our beliefs might change, but we have the same types of experiences. So if that is what John Paul II is referring to, which it seems like he is, and I think a lot of traditionalists have backed me up on that, if that's what he's saying then this makes sense. You can, have a you can have an organization that has the traditional mass, but don't go start getting too trad in your dogmas. Otherwise, we might have to come down with a bigger stick because that's not living tradition. And I think, I think that is a reasonable, I think that's a reasonable assessment. And again, this has nothing to do with the individual fraternity priest. This just has to do with this doctrine, this, this ecclesiastical mess we find ourselves in. And the fraternity is very much demonstrating through this interesting history this conflict between tradition and the conciliar paradigm that they're really on a tightrope and a friend of mine he said to me you know the fraternity is really walking on a tightrope meaning they fall one they go they go a little bit too traditional in the exterior sense like a little bit too sspx sounding and they're going to be crushed and if they go a little bit too you know conciliar sounding they're going to be legitimate in the eyes of traditionalists it's an impossible place to be in, in the long term. And my friend said to me, it's like they're on the tightrope, but they either have to make it, they got to make a decision of what they're going to do because the tightrope does not extend infinitely. Eventually it ends. And this is what we're worried about. If the tightrope is going to end, the fraternity is going to be in a position where they're going to have some difficult decisions to make. Okay. So we're going to look at the difference between the old understanding of tradition and the new understanding of tradition and see if what we look at from John Paul II seems like it really even fits the old understanding of tradition. So I have an article here. I'll bring it up from my sub stack. Let me find this here. And uh, it was an article initially that I wrote uh, called Join the SSPX and Go Partially to Hell. And the reason I was making a joke about that is because if the idea is that, uh, you know, if the idea is that uh, they're not in full communion, it's like, well, only a little bit of you goes to hell, not the whole of you, because it's not you're not fully outside the church. You're just a little bit. Anyway, so here's a document. So compare and contrast the old understanding and the new understanding. The old understanding, Vatican I. 
The doctrine of faith which God revealed has been entrusted as a divine deposit to the spouse of Christ to be faithfully guarded and infallibly interpreted. Hence, also that, mis that understanding of its sacred dogmas must be perpetually retained, which Holy Mother Church has once declared. And there must never be recession from that meaning under the specious name of a deeper understanding. So this corresponds, you know, we, can, we contemplate these things, we come to know them better, this, and, then, and then all of a sudden this is living tradition. This is what John Paul II is getting at. Therefore, let the understanding, the knowledge and wisdom of individuals as of us all, of one man as of the whole church, grow and progress strongly with the passage of the ages and the centuries, but let it be solely in its own genus, namely the same dogma with the same sense and the same understanding. This is a quotation from St. Vincent of Larens right here. And uh, remember this because St. Vincent of Larens is important because Ratzinger is going to talk about him a little bit. Vatican II, this is the new understanding. The tradition that comes from the Holy Apostles, this is the same thing we read, um, makes progress in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit. There is a growth and in insight into the realities and words that are being passed on. This comes through the contemplation and study of believers who ponder these things in their hearts. It comes from the intimate sense of spiritual realities which they experience. So this is experience, experience, experience. As the centuries succeed one another, the church constantly moves forward toward the fullness of divine truth until the words of God reach their complete fulfillment in her. So this is very problematic. As the centuries succeed one another, the church constantly moves toward the fullness of divine truth. Does the church not already have the fullness of divine truth? Is the, is the Bible and sacred tradition, which is apostolic, is that not the fullness of divine truth? That's a very troubling statement. Now, one can make an argument and say, well, hold on, we come to understand these things more. At the same time, this does sound like this idea that there will be further revelation, which is heresy. Think about it. Old understanding. Pope Pius IX, the Church of Christ, watchful guardian that she is, and defender of the dogmas deposited with her, never changes anything, never diminishes anything, never adds anything to them. Interesting. Father Joseph Ratzinger, this is before he was, you know, cardinal and so forth. This is 1969. He, St. Vincent of Larens, remember him, no longer appears as an authentic representative of the Catholic idea of tradition, but outlines a canon of tradition based on a semi-Pelagian idea. Now that is quite the accusation. So First Vatican Council is citing St. Vincent of Larens, and, he's, and it's saying, we understand it in its own genus, in the same dogma, with the same sense and the same understanding. So infallible Council Vatican I versus non-infallible Council Vatican II. Infallible Council Vatican I is saying St. Vincent Larens' understanding of tradition is hunky-dory. Joseph Ratzinger commenting on Vatican II says, this saint, good old St. Vincent, Seems like he might be semi-Pelagian. So semi-heretical. Oof, that is not good. Old understanding, Pope St. Pius X. Tradition, as understood by the modernist, and this is in Pashendi, is a communication with others of an original experience. Now let's just pause there for a second. Let's just go back up. Let's look at Vatican II. What do we see here? It come. This is a tradition. It comes from the intimate sense of spiritual realities which they experience. Now here's Pius X saying, tradition as understood by the modernists is a communication with others of an original experience through preaching by means of the intellectual formula. To this formula, in addition to its representative value, they attribute a species of suggestive efficacy, which acts firstly in the believer by stimulating the religious sense, and secondly in those who do not yet believe by awakening in them for the first time the religious sense and producing the experience. In this way, is religious experience spread about, abroad among the nations. So this is exactly this understanding of this new type of tradition. So tradition is based on experience. You awaken the same experience in people. And therefore, this is part of religious li living tradition. Very problematic. A new understanding. This is Pope Benedict XVI. And this is from 2005. It is clear that this commitment to expressing a specific truth in a new way demands new thinking on this truth and a new and vital relationship with it. The Second Vatican Council with its new definition. Isn't that amazing? We were told the Second Vatican Council never defined anything, but anyway. Uh, with its new definition of the relationship between the faith of the church and certain essential elements of modern thought 
has reviewed or even corrected certain historical decisions. But in this apparent discontinuity, it has actually preserved and deepened her in innermost nature and true identity. So the old understanding of tradition is fixed while the new considers it as changing. In the traditional sense, tradition is objective. This is dogmas. While for the new notion, it is subjective in experiences. So traditionally, man believes what he is told. The modernist tells what he believes. And this is the last thing we'll go from Pope Benedict the 16th, a year later, 2006. He says, The church's apostolic tradition consists in the transmission of the goods of salvation, which through the power of the Spirit makes the Christian community the permanent actual actualization of the original communion. What does this even mean? Anyway, tradition is the communion of the faithful. So tradition is the communion of the faithful, not the deposit of faith. Tradition is the communion of the faithful around their legitimate pastors down through history, a communion that the Holy Spirit nurtures, assuring the connection between the experience of the apostolic faith, so experience of the faith, not believing it, experiencing it, lived in the original community of the disciples and the actual experience of Christ in his church. So I think you see what I'm getting at here. So, so if this document is at the foundation of the fraternity, then this is where the rubber is going to meet the road when Rome is going to expect the fraternity to get in line and say, get with the Novus Ordo conciliar program. And again, I understand the priests of the fraternity probably agree with me. I would imagine the vast majority do, and I've met many of them, and they do agree with me. And they'll tell me, you know, privately, Archbishop Lefebvre's a saint and so forth. But the fact remains that according to the FSSP itself, that document that cites living tradition, that cites this very modernist sounding thing from JP2 and Vatican II, that is admittedly at the origin of the foundations of the fraternity. So here is where we're going to have an issue. Now, and if you think I'm cherry picking, again, I'm not picking on the FSSP here. I'm concerned about the priests and the faithful because I think Pope Francis very well could shut them down. Some people think that he won't, but Pope Francis hates tradition. He's a politician, so he may politically keep him around, but a French author or French, there's a French saying, and it's revolution is like a bicycle. You have to keep pedaling, otherwise you fall over. Do you think they're going to stop? I don't think so. And Taylor Marshall has said this, that he's doing the whole corral thing, you know, get all these trads together and then excommunicate them all or whatever, not excommunicate them, but just sort of put them off into the SSPX, get out of the church kind of thing. So I'm not cherry picking here. And I'm going to show you another example. And I'm going to bring up an article here. Make sure I have it. Where is it? This is from The Remnant a while back. Just give me half a second here to make sure that I actually have it. Oh, I have to click the link again. So I have an article here from a while back. Here it is. So um, in this article, this is an interview with then uh, Superior, who was Father John Berg, Superior General of the Fraternity. And this is what he said. And I'll read it to you, and then I'll show you in the thing. The question was, I'm oh, sorry, I should bring up that article. Um, here it is. Boom. And the question is, is it a mission of the FSSP or of specific FSSP theologian priests to attempt to show the hermeneutic of continuity with certain difficult passages of the Second Vatican Council in the light of tradition, for instance, religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, and interreligious dialogue? The answer from the superior was, this is a mission that was given to the fraternity from the protocol at its very foundation. Remember the protocol, because that's very interesting. That's very interesting. And um, again, here is the... Uh, I'll show you the question. Let's see here. Mission. Just do that. Yeah. This is where I've just read right here. Um, and they would say, and then we'll expand, it says, I would say this is carried out at two levels. Any society that forms priests to go out and to do work has to form them in accord with what they think those priests are going to face. And anyway, it goes on. But point being, is it part of the FSSP ethos that we're going to make these Vatican II novelties seem like they're traditional? It seems like the answer from the superior is yes. And again, I don't think that many, I think a lot of priests in the FSSP don't agree with this. But this is what the officialdom is saying. Okay, so let's continue here. Now, as I said, none of this is to suggest that there are not priests in the FSSP who have a problem with this. But we're going to look now at the FSSP response to Traditionis Custodis. And this is going to be fascinating. 
so I'm going to bring that up here. So I've got a thousand tabs. I want to make sure I want to make sure that I came with the goods. Okay, I didn't want to seem like I'm just doing some cherry picking here. I want to make sure that uh, I'm actually because again, this has nothing to do with being anti FSSP. This is just if it's on the chopping block, the faithful need to understand why and be prepared. And the priests themselves, maybe many priests in the fraternity had never thought of this. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Um, okay, so let me just find. Uh, okay, so this is my, this is their fraternity's response, the communique of the superiors general, the Ecclesia Day communities. So this isn't just FSSP. This is also, um, I guess, this is also uh, Institute and others. Um, okay, and this is in response to Traditionis Custodis, which was Pope Francis's nuclear bomb on the mass. And here it goes. It says. We do not see ourselves as the true church in any way. On the contrary, we see in the Catholic Church our mother in whom we find salvation and faith. Um, uh, we are lo loyally subject to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Pontiff and that of the diocesan bishops as demonstrated by the good relations in the diocese, etc., etc. And the result of canonical or apostolic visits in recent years, we reaffirm our adherence to the... Ma this is a money line right here. We reaffirm our adherence to the magisterium, including that of Vatican II, and what follows? Everything that follows? That's problematic. According to the Catholic doctrine of the ascent due to it, etc., 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 from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Lumen Gentium, my modernist senses are tingling, as evidenced by the numerous studies and doctrinal st uh, theses carried out by us over the past 33 years, etc., etc., etc. And it says... <clears throat> We beg for a humane, personal, trusting dialogue far from ideologies or the coldness of administrative decrees. We would like to be able to meet a person who will be for us the face of motherhood of the church, etc. So the fraternity and the other institutes are saying, you know, we are okay with Vatican II. It's good and we like everything that follows. This is very difficult for a traditionalist to reconcile. And again, I believe many of the priests don't agree with this. And here goes on to, uh, it's talking about how John Paul II and Pope Benedict set us up. And then here's another important paragraph. It says, they were promised that all measures would be taken to guarantee the identity of their institutes in the full communion of the Catholic Church. The first institutes accepted with gratitude the canonical recognition offered by the Holy See in full attachment to the traditional pedagogies of the faith, particularly in the liturgical field based on the memorandum of understanding, this is the protocol, between Ratzinger and Lefebvre. We're going to look at that in detail in a minute. This solemn commitment was expressed in the modo proprio Ecclesia Dei, then in a diversified manner for each institute, etc., etc., etc. So the, the statement here is that the traditional pedagogies of the faith, particularly in liturgy, and this is based on what Archbishop Lefebvre signed with Ratzinger, we're going to see that that's not necessarily, well, that's not necessarily accurate. And then this shared understanding was expressed in Ecclesia Day. I don't think that's true. I think that I think that this means that these Ecclesia Day communities are on shaky ground and we're going to look at why. So here's the portion of the show where I'd like to actually bring up the formula. Okay? So uh what am I talking about here? Well, I'm just going to show you real quick. Oopsie daisy. I actually have it open here. I'm showing you how the sausage is made. <laughs> I was just showing you my notes. Um, the very sophisticated here, the Kennedy Report. I use Apple Notes for my stuff. So here is an article. Um, and this is from an old, this is from an old um, publication by the by a priest in the SSPX, Father Scott. I don't know if this was an Angelus magazine. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's called The St. Peter's in the Line of Archbishop Lefebvre. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. Admittedly, it's kind of polemical. This was also written in like 1990. Tempers were, were hot. I'm not saying that I, I think that the, the fraternity splitting from the SSPX was good. I'm just saying the language is very much in the vein of what happened at the time. So I'm not saying I don't agree with this letter. I'm just saying for the purposes of this show, uh, in this moment of confusion and crisis, it may not be the thing that many of you are looking to hear. So I'm just going to point you to this if you want to read it. And in this, he goes over the idea that the fraternity signed the same formula that the Archbishop Lefebvre signed, because that's important. Okay. 
And um, so, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, for a little background, Archbishop Lefebvre, he signed a formula, a protocol with Cardinal Ratzinger, which I'm going to read most of it to you here, May 5th, 1988. And the idea is that Archbishop Lefebvre signed this and the fraternity continued to follow it. That's not really true. And we're going to look at why and what this has to do with the potential problem that they find themselves in right now. Now, before we read that, just let, take a look at this quickly. So this is from a Latin Mass Magazine article from years ago. Father Berg, you can see on the, I don't know, left, left whatever side of your screen, where my the blue highlight is here. Okay. Father Berg, the fraternity of St. Peter has remained faithful to the protocol of, and he was a superior, of May 5th, 1988, which was proposed by Cardinal Ratzinger and originally uh, signed by Archbishop Lefebvre, in which we received without any change of any kind. Hmm. If that's not true, that's a problem. And here's, you got to ask yourself something. You got to ask yourself something. Do you really think Rome is fine with the fraternity believing exactly what the SSPX signed on to? I don't think so. I don't think so. Then why wouldn't the SSPX be normalized? Think about it. Think about it. It doesn't make any sense. So, all right, let's actually look at the protocol. I'm going to just read portions of it. And, okay, so the May 5th protocol signed by Archbishop Lefebvre. The first relevant part. I, Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, promise to be always faithful to the Catholic Church and the Roman Pontiff, its supreme pastor, vicar of Christ, successor of the blessed Peter in his primacy as head of the body of bishops. This is the FSSP. It's not called the protocol. It's called the formula adhesiones. And for evidence that there is a difference between the uh, SSPX protocol and the adhesiones of the fraternity, I can actually pull you up something real quickly here from, I think it was from 2008, and I'll just bring that up quickly. So here is something from New Liturgical Movement. This is an interview from 2008. I've highlighted it there. And this is about, this is from Cardinal Hoyos. I think it was, I think it was Cardinal Castrion Hoyos. Yeah, Cardinal Castrion on the motu proprio. Anyway, this has to do with the traditional communities, blah, blah, blah. They bring up the SSPX, and here is it says. So the Pope off, and that, this is after uh, Samorum Pontificum, by the way. And it says, uh, the Pope offers to the church a treasure which is spiritual, cultural, religious, and Catholic. We have received letters of agreement also from prelates of the Orthodox churches, from Anglican and Protestant faithful. Oh, great, who cares? Lastly, there are some priests of the Fraternity of St. Pius X who uh, singly are seeking to regularize their position. Some of them have already signed the formula of adhesion. Hmm. Okay, what's the formula of adhesion? Okay, so the formula of adhesion is what we're talking about, which the brass of the fraternity is referring to as the same thing as the protocol of Archbishop Lefebvre, but here's Cardinal Castrion Hoyos dealing with this, saying that they have to sign this in order to show that they are like us and not like the SSPX. Think about that for a second. It just simply can't be the case that they're the same. A little bit of investigative work, it can't be the case. And why am I doing all this? Again, why am I doing this? Because I care about traditional Catholicism. I care about the good priests I've met in the Fraternity of St. Peter. I care about the very good friends I have who attend this Fraternity of St. Peter, and they don't want to have their Latin Mass and their traditional Catholic faith taken away. So if there seems to be a crack in the dam, then this has to be brought to the light so people can know what they're getting themselves into so they can know how to fix the situation. I don't have a solution. I'm just saying this is the information. Um, okay, so let's read these. Let's continue to read. So, SSPX protocol versus fraternity formula adhesions. The first problem, and again, they say that they have the same one, but we know from Cardinal Hoyos and, for, and from history that they don't. So that's a problem. So the FSSP priests, at least officially, again, I'm sure there's discrepancy, but at least on paper, promised fidelity to the head of the College of Bishops. Archbishop Lefebvre refused to say the word collegiality or College of Bishops because of collegiality. We can't go into the errors of ecclesiality here. I thought this podcast was going to be like half an hour. We're already at 40 minutes. We've still got 15 minutes left probably. Okay. Next part, uh, it has to do with um, 
uh, Lumen Gentium 25. They do agree on that. They're basically the same, which is why that was cited in that article I just showed you. Um, I can, um, it's in somewhere else. But anyway, uh, the art, one of the articles I showed you from Latin Mass Magazine, it says, look, we have the same protocol. And that's true. They picked a part where it's the same, but there's other parts where it's not the same. And this is the next part that's interesting. So this is from uh, section three, roughly, of this uh, protocol, this formula. Okay. So uh, SSPX1 says, regarding certain points taught by the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, or concerning later reforms of the liturgy and law, and which do not appear to us easily reconcilable with tradition, we pledge that we will still have a positive attitude of study and communication with the Apostolic See, avoiding all polemics. So basically... We don't really see how this is traditional. That's what Archbishop Lefebvre was saying. But I'm open to looking into it. That's fine. I, I get that. This is what the fraternity's corresponding paragraph says. It says this. Concerning other doctrines, that's different, which the Second Vatican Council teaches or concerning um, posterior reforms, be they liturgical or canonical, which are viewed by some as being difficult to conciliate with preceding magisterial declarations, I assume the obligation of following a positive line of study and communication with the Holy See while avoiding all polemic. Similar, very different. Here's why. So FSS pre, the, the formula for the SSP admits that some might see a contradiction between pre and post conciliar stuff, but not that they themselves, now they might, but as an organization, they're not saying that. It's not really clear as opposed um, to tradition. So they're not saying that they see them, that they themselves necessarily hold things, that they, sorry, they're not saying that they see what is in the conciliar paradigm as opposed to tradition per se. And that's the diff that's different than Archbishop Lefebvre. Archbishop Lefebvre said, we do not see this. Whereas the fraternity one is saying, some may not see this. That's a big difference because again, why am I saying this? Because if Pope Francis is considering shutting down the fraternity, if he comes to them and says, why do you exist? And they say, because we're traditional. He's like, well, look at your document here. Some of you are, some of you aren't. Which is it? And this is where, you know, traditional commentators have been saying for a long time, because they love tradition, not because they're anti-FSSP, but because they care about the faith, they care about tradition, they care about the liturgy, they care about their friends and family who go to fraternity parishes, and they don't want it to be ripped away from them. But there's nothing to stand on if it's just, well, tradition's really nice for us, but Vatican II is good too. That's not going to cut it if they come for you saying, give me a reason why you still exist. I mean, these are important things to think about. All right. Um, also interesting that they use the term doctrine because the fraternity would never say that they reject doctrines. So if they're saying they're doctrines of the Second Vatican Council, then they're implying that they believe them. But Vatican II define no new doctrines according to the Pope's oversight, but that's all their conversation. Number four, it says, moreover, we declare that we recognize the validity, this is the SSPX, validity, and in Latin the word used there, because they're in Latin originally, so that's important. It says, validati, sorry, vali, validitatem, that's the word used, of the sacrifice of the Mass and the sacraments done in the new rite, blah, 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 blah. The FSSP one says, I also declare that I accept the validity, and the word in Latin that is used is validudinem. The very different word, it makes all the difference in the world. We'll explain that in a sec. Of the sacrifice of the Mass, and of which the sacraments, the, it basically saying, we accept as validudinem, according to the fraternity, the new rite sacraments, including the Mass. SSPX is saying, we accept that we rec recognize, um, and different words there too, SSPX says, we declare that we recognize. So I recognize, yeah, that's a thing. You're doing that thing. Fraternity is saying, we accept the validudinem. What does that mean? So Archbishop Lefebvre accepted the validity of the new right sacraments in the sense of them being done in the right way, right form, all that. Fine. But at the same time, recognizing there were elements in the modern liturgy that contradicted tradition, which there are, but the priest can say the words of consecration. This is a valid mass. No one denies this. Even most say they, some, but most say they wouldn't deny that. Now, the FSSP uses the term validudinem. What does that mean? It's very different 
from, and you know what, I'll actually bring this on the screen here so you can see this rather than me just talking about it. Okay, so you can see this on my screen here. I'll make this bigger, that's as big as it can go. Okay, the FSSP uses the Latin term valitudinem, which translates as strength, good health, effectiveness, powerfulness, versus the usual valid, uh, validitatem, validity, um, which was used by the SSPX. And this admits much more than simple validity, but also the effectiveness, correctness, goodness, and uprightness. So officially, and again, I don't believe most FSSP priests believe this. I'm not creating a straw man here. I'm just saying according to their documents. The FSSP's protocol, which their officials, their superiors, have said is the same as the SSPX, and we're seeing that it's not. It's not the same. I don't know why they're saying that. I really don't know why. I'm not accusing them of lying. I'm just saying it's not the same. It's just manifestly not the same. The SSPX is saying valid. Yeah, valid. The fraternity is saying valitudinem, which means good strength, good health, effectiveness, powerfulness, etc. They're saying the Novus Ordo is good. No traditionalist believes the Novus Ordo is good, strong, effective, etc. Again, read this book by Dr. K. The Novus Ordo is an abomination. Uh, you know, it's valid, but you, validity is a very low bar. You can celebrate a valid mass in the back of a pickup truck with heavy metal music. It's not a good mass. The, act, the singular re reduced act of consecration can never be bad. But anyway, this is reductionist philosophy to say that it's good because there's just a, a consecration. This is not acceptable with traditional Catholic thinking. The new mass is not valetudinum. It's not strong. It's not good, good and healthy. It's not effective. It's not powerful. It's not. And no traditionalist believes that. That's a big problem. And again, if this is in their, if this is in their information, Pope Francis is going to come and say, "Hey guys, you say the traditional. You say the new mass is valetudinum, healthy, good, powerful, upright, effective. Just say it then. Just say it." What are these poor priests going to say? And I say this because personally, I think that they're in an impossible position and I don't envy them. Okay. And um, here's the last thing. May 5th protocol from the SSPX. It says, finally, we promise to respect the common and respect is very different. Doesn't mean obey. Doesn't mean adhere to. Just means, okay, I respect that. <laughs> That's right. I respect that. But doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you. We promise to respect the common discipline of the church and the ecclesiastical laws, especially those contained in the Code of Canon Law promulgated by John Paul II, without prejudice to the special discipline granted to the society by particular law. Okay. As FSSP formula. Finally, I promise to adhere to the common discipline. So different, not respect, but I adhere to the common discipline of the church and to her laws, especially those which are contained in the Code of Canon Law promulgated by John Paul II. Okay. Commentary, what does this mean? So Archbishop Lefebvre promised to respect the common discipline, but under the explicit proviso that he did not respect all the laws and had the right to refuse. This is very clear in it. Because he said, without prejudice to the special discipline granted to the society by a particular law. Okay. He did not promise to follow all the post-conciliar laws, as do the FSSP. Now, you can disagree with the SSPX and Archbishop Lefebvre on that, but it's not the same thing. And in the formula for the FSSP, the sentence without prejudice to the special discipline granted to the society by a particular law, that was eliminated. That was really important. Why? Because Archbishop Lefebvre was saying, I respect the 1983 code. It's the code of the church. Now, there's many people that think the code is problematic, and I do too. In fact, um, Pope Francis's letter on, was it Desiderio Desideravi? On the Eucharist, everyone was freaked out about that. That's found in canon law. It was there for a long time, by the way. You know, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. There's heresy in canon law. I did a show on this a couple years ago. Um, or at least there's something adjacent to heresy, which is bad enough. And canon law is not infallible. If it was, it wouldn't be able to change. So relax, you Pope Splainers. Um, so the fraternity takes out... The, so for the fraternity, in their formula, they have no basis for... A legal assault against them because the, the the protocol Archbishop Lefebvre signed was like, yeah, I respect that's the law, but there's a particular proviso for us that we are going to hold to, meaning we're not going anywhere. And he signed this with Ratzinger. And the fraternity says they have the same protocol as Archbishop Lefebvre, and they don't. And in the protocol from the fraternity, 
there's an issue. There's a few issues. I think that's the, 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 the bulk of the information I wanted to get through here. I sincerely hope, my friends that are fraternity supporters and things, and priests, if you're listening, this, again, I'm not trying to be polemical here. This is not against any particular person. But it's very troubling that the fraternity is asking for prayers because of the troubles of traditionis custodis, which means getting rid of tradition. And then the fraternity's superiors having a meeting with Pope Francis just after that novena is done. It could, be, it could work out fine. But even if it works out fine this time, we're 36 years removed from 1988 and the fraternity is still asking for prayers because they're not, no, they don't know if they're going to continue. So, you know, if you're a fraternity priest, if, if they tell you tomorrow to shut down your parish, what are you going to do? I'm just asking. What are you going to do? That's not an easy... I mean, what are you going to do? If you go to a fraternity parish and they shut it down, what are you going to do? I don't envy this position. This is not... Again, this is not anti-fraternity. This is not anti-Ecclesia Day Commission things in general. But these are just facts. So I think at a certain point, the priests of the fraternity who are, let's call them very Lefebvre-minded, they're going to have to recognize the faulty foundation based in these documents, which are the legal documents. And we know, we know the church loves legalism today. And I mean this in the institutional sense. The mystical body of Christ does not love legalism, but... The, the leaders of the church, they are Pharisees. They love legalism. They love it. It's their favorite thing. Legalistically speaking, tomorrow the Pope could say, say the new mass. You think it's really good. You have no ground to stand on. Get in line or get out. That's a fact. And again, I'm going to recommend this book, Bound by Truth. Dr. K goes through not this particular topic, but he goes through all these questions essentially in more of a roundabout way in different sections of the book. And he basically says, you know, traditional priests, he talks, he, he gives advice to traditional priests what to do if their masses get taken away. He says, you know, okay, you can try these things. You can try home masses underground. You can try all these things. He says, but at a certain point, you know, he actually references uh, in France in the 1980s, there was a group of traditionalists that literally knocked down the cement wall or brick wall of that a bishop had erected to keep the traditionalists out of the church and they went in and said mass and i think now the institute of christ the king is there or something like that tradition has its own rights you don't have to appeal for the rights of tradition because that's like appealing for the rights of scripture isn't that crazy i mean think about that we have even the new catechism says sacred tradition and scripture the church's sacred tradition sacred tradition and scripture my show that I did with Dr. K, it's going to be available soon. It's available for paid subscribers already. We talk about how in, in the ancient times, I read a quote from St. Basil the Great. I think it was St. Basil the Great. I read a lot of quotes. And he's appealing to the Trinity as being something they've just always believed in of divine origin. And he's appealing to all these traditions. And he's basically saying, hey, guys, we just have tradition. And he's saying it comes from before even their theological understandings of scriptures. He's just saying, this is what's passed on to us by the apostles, meaning this thing is fund fundamental. Tradition has its own rights. You cannot say you're no longer allowed to have tradition. You don't have to appeal for your rights for tradition. You don't go and say, this is like saying, you know, I'm going to ask the government if I'm allowed to feed my kids. You don't do that. You just feed them. I think this makes sense. So, Listen, to the fraternity supporters and priests and things, these are problematic things within the official documents, which I am certain many of you do not believe, and I would never suggest you do, and that would be a straw man, and I would never do that. But they're existing nonetheless, and I know there is discord within the fraternity. This has been evident over, evidence over the years. Some are getting too trad. Some don't like it, whatever. <clears throat> They've had to bring in the brass from Rome to fix it up. That's, these things have kind of happened in the past. So if this tightrope is going to end, what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. Everyone pray for the fraternity of St. Peter and pray for the priests of the fraternity and the faithful that they make the right decisions when those decisions come. All right. As always, this has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.